We have been drying out a little bit here in Texas. A little cumulus up there at 4,000 feet. And what does that look like on the sounding? Let's take a look. This is the sounding plot from the high resolution rapid refresh model. And that shows a very characteristic summertime appearance. You can see the low level moisture right there 70s and upper 60s dew points all the way up to about four to five thousand feet and then a little bit of dry air above that some of that gets entrained down to the surface and as a result we don't really get any widespread convective showers and thunderstorms it is definitely a little bit drier and there's the temperature plot coming up from 87 fahrenheit dry debatic all the way up to about cloud base level and then above that a little bit of uh, moderate lapse rates, enough to support a little bit of convection. You see that wet 80 bat right there. It follows that from the cloud base, which is about right here. So you get a little bit of vertical growth here and there, but I think overall we're actually a little bit suppressed. I think there's some dry air coming down to the surface. There's the surface chart on this Wednesday afternoon frontal system extending from Minnesota down through Nebraska and into eastern Colorado. You can see the north winds and 70s and lower 80s temperatures back behind that. Ahead of it, very warm. There's low 90s right there with a southwest wind in Kansas and much the same down to the south, just kind of hot and sultry. In the western U.S., a little bit of a respite from the heat wave only 104 at Blythe and 97 at Las Vegas. And yeah, that's quite a bit cooler than what we had a couple days ago. And likewise, the Great Basin, still hot, but nothing like what we saw last week. The eastern U.S. underneath the influence of the Bermuda High, that's it right there, extending into the southern U.S. as a ridge. And that ridge extension is very important in forecasting because that moderates the type of weather we get in the eastern half of the country. So with that high covering much of the southern U.S., that will tend to somewhat suppress some of the thunderstorm activity and route most of the onshore flow into Texas, where we do have a couple of showers going up this afternoon. And the tropical conveyor belt of moisture heading right into Illinois there, supporting this MCS moving through Wisconsin into northern Illinois and back behind it an outflow pool from a meso high that's along the length of that MCS. Let's take a look at the SPC products. And there's the current situation enhanced risk for northern Iowa and southern Wisconsin. Looks like they're expecting some redevelopment back there behind the MCS. You can see that tornado watch going up for much of Iowa. So very likely we're going to be watching this area initially for development. Let's take a closer look at that. And we see the outgoing MCS right here. And back behind it, a cumulus field starting to show up. Doesn't look like very much of it. In fact, mostly what we have here is a lot of debris from stuff in the Rockies and on the backside of the MCS. And there's the surface chart for this afternoon. We're going to refine that large scale analysis and look at the mesoscale. So we have a low right there in northwestern Iowa, cold front extending southwest, and I think the warm front may be running about like that, maybe a combination of outflow and warm front. I do know that the synoptic scale warm front kind of runs up through Wisconsin in this area. So this, of course, will call for a little bit of refinement. On the leading edge, we find the MCS way out east and the boundary kind of running about like that. So looking at the moisture field, the moisture axis, that's going to be located right about here. See that 77 degree dew point at, uh, what is that, Sin? Can, uh, I don't know what that is. And I think that's Waterloo right there. No, I think that's Atlantic. Yeah, my Iowa geography is not very impressive. But there's the moist axis, the intersection of the boundary. So if I was going to be out chasing, I'd probably want to kind of keep an eye on that area right there. 
And taking a look up in Canada and the Arctic, it's starting to look a little bit more like winter. Not so much in the prairies, we've still got warm air advection right in this region here, but further north you can see this, uh, yeah, by the way, these red lines, these are thickness. That's 1,000 through 500 millibar thickness, and that's kind of an average, it's sort of like a mean temperature in the lowest three kilometers. So that tells us that there's a lot of cold air north of this line here and the center of that cold air across Banks Island, Melville Island, and Victoria Island. So out there in the Western Arctic, and you can see the cooler temperatures contrasting from the 50s and 60s we had a couple of days ago in that region. So that cold air is certainly moving south, and it could make some headway into Canada over the next couple of days, but I don't expect that to go too far south. And Alaska looks like they've returned to more seasonal temperatures, 60s, and I don't, I don't see any 70s or 80s in that part of the continent. And then a quick glimpse out in the Pacific shows a subtropical high over the North Pacific there, 1033, 1034 millibars, and that's giving a westerly component out there off the northwest coast. And some of that marine air is making it inland to the Cascades. Temperatures a nice, comfortable 67 at Portland, 60 at Seattle. But you can see inland that marine air does not go very far into the desert. Still 93 to 88 and 90. And that's very common for this time of year. It really takes a very dense, strong push of cold air to bring that eastward into the deserts. And that doesn't happen very often. So this will kind of be the status quo, most likely over the next couple of days. However, you can see the thickness contours kind of close together right there. So we would have to watch that for the possibility of frontogenesis. And for that, we're going to have to take a look at the models. And there's your sneak peek at the models. We go to the West Coast and you can see the pressure contours, the, the isobars, they're packed very close together along the Cascades, and that's representing the difference between the marine air to the west and the hot, dry desert air. And you can see the packing of that thickness contour. I do them every three instead of every six on my surface charts to kind of bring out that contrast. So let's see what happens. I don't really expect that zone to really do very much. And you can see, yeah, there's no frontogenesis. That's just the contrast between the marine layer and the dry desert air. Okay, elsewhere around the country, let's see what's happening. Our front, of course, running about like that. There's our MCS a few hours ago. And we bring that forward. You can see that development there in Iowa near that surface low. And Arizona gets going. They're hanging on to that monsoon pattern. In fact, let's check out the dew points. Who? how about them apples? 67 at Phoenix. That's a high dew point for that area. 69 at Casa Grande, 66 at Tucson, and 64 at uh, Gila Bend. So those dew points are definitely up there. Even in the California deserts, we've got 65 to 61. And that moisture is starting to come in contact with the mountains out near Riverside, west of Palm Springs. I, I'm not really sure what that mountain range is. but So we could bring some of the moisture out into this area right there. And we could see some development way out west. However, it looks like a classic monsoon day. And Flagstaff already getting some thunderstorms at this hour. So I'll bring you up to speed what's going on with that monsoon. We have Nevada here, Las Vegas right there, Southern California in this area here, Arizona located right in here, and Utah up near the top right. This is at dawn yesterday morning, and you can see a strong MCS around the Kingman area. It's about 50 miles southeast of Vegas. And running that through... The MCS dies off during the morning, and then as we get the surface heating, we get convection building on the Mogollon Rim right here. So those get going, plenty of storms out around Prescott and Flagstaff, and then look up north up here. This is kind of a 
unusual progression of storms. This is way up around uh, Caliente to Ely. And this is going to be about 6 p.m. yesterday. And watch as these build southward. So th this uh, complex drives south just northeast of Las Vegas. We're now up to about 10, 11 o'clock last night. There's some evidence of outflow right here. Outflow usually does not show up very well in infrared because it's a low-level feature. And you can see that MCS kind of continuing to build southward. And we're finding elements of it all the way down through Phoenix this morning and then into the area around Tucson, way off the bottom of the chart this afternoon. So let's shift down there. So here we are. We're starting at about dawn. MCS moves into the Phoenix area. There it is, about uh, 7 or 8 a.m. And then it propagates southward into the Tucson area. So this thing has covered a good 400 miles at least. Kind of an unusual MCS. It looks like it's already all the way down towards Mexico at this point. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with convective debris. We can see that very plainly on the visible imagery. That's it right there. So the atmosphere is kind of overturned in this area. And that's going to suppress thunderstorms at least for a little while. However, there could be more on the way up there near the top of the screen. Yeah, see that right there? So it could be an active night. We'll just have to see how things work out. The high resolution rapid refresh is always good for a look three to six hours from now. And what it's forecasting is stuff developing from Seligman to Flagstaff, talking about this area right here, and propagating south much like last night towards Phoenix, but it looks like it dies out before it gets there. That's around nine o'clock this afternoon. Another MCS gets going overnight, okay, and that works south. That could reach uh, central Arizona overnight. The model not explicitly showing that, but going by continuity by what happened yesterday into this morning, there still is that potential. Returning to the swamplands out in the eastern U.S., well, we've got onshore flow moving into Texas. You can see that right there. Precipitable waters running one and a half to two and a quarter inches through that region. That's right there. And that moisture is not going to go anywhere. In fact, if I run this forward, you're going to see it just flowing up on the Texas coast and just kind of piling up there. However, changes are coming up from the north. Now, remember that frontal boundary we talked about starting out, which is in this area right here. You can see it delineated by this drier greenish color. So the atmosphere in that region is much drier. And that's a good marker for the location of that front. And watch that greenish color push southward over the next several days. It's very slow going, but it's making progress southward. There it is through Kentucky by Monday and all the way into Tennessee and Arkansas by Wednesday. So it's very slowly sinking south, and that's acting as a backdoor front so by next Thursday, about a week from now, it's going to be in through this area. And, of course, with the moisture impinging on that boundary, that zone is going to be a very good focus for precipitation. And another focus for precipitation in the short term is the sea breeze. Watch this area along the coast. Houston is located right here, and Beaumont right there, Lake Charles here, and Victoria about there. So what you're going to see here, this is this morning, about 7 to 8 a.m., you're going to see that sea breeze come together. There it is forming up in South Houston, some cumulonimbus clouds starting to pop up. And you can see that organize as the afternoon goes on. And this is where, where we're at about right now. Very well-developed sea breeze, even some outflow out ahead of these cells. And this is this usually propagates to the north. This is a very common mode of precipitation in the eastern half of Texas. This rarely makes it up into the Dallas area, Texarkana, Shreveport, but sometimes it does. And that tends to be 
around dark or just after, but usually that's around the time this stuff shuts down. So feel free to check that out on the satellite sites like College of DuPage, and you can keep tabs on what that's doing. And that's all for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank Nick Hodson in the UK for being a new supporter. Thank you very much. Welcome. And the new schedule Monday for the supporters, Wednesday, Friday for everybody else. That's going to be necessary so I can keep balanced with my work. The production takes about four to five hours every afternoon, and that is a lot of time. However, We'll continue to pack these episodes with information, so that adds up to about 45 minutes per week still. In the meantime, take a look here. We're going to poke our heads up and look to the south. That's going to be the sea breeze approaching from the south. So maybe, maybe you can see it off there in the distance. So check it out, and we will talk to you on Friday. Bye-bye. <laughs>